This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 167, recorded January 19th, 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today, right here in studio, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. Enthusiasm? Absolutely. (laughs) How you doing, Dixon? I'm doing great. Excellent. How are you doing? I'm just wonderful. Excellent. As always. Excellent. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How are you, Alan? Doing quite well. Working away? Yeah. Yeah, keeping pretty busy. All right. And also joining us from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, fellas. How are you, Rich? I'm good. How are you doing? We're here. Good, good. (laughs) We're doing well. We're talking about viruses. What could be better? Yeah, this is good. Here, here. Today we're going to talk about a movie, and this is not a three-dimensional reconstruction (laughs) type movie. It's not a movie of a plaque developing. Right. It's an actual Hollywood movie called Contagion, which came out a while ago, and it's just now, uh, I guess, rentable, so we've all seen it. Is that correct? Everyone's seen it? No, I haven't seen it yet. I I Uh, Dixon hasn't seen it. Dixon, you didn't do your homework. I told you, I live in Jersey. (laughs) Well, well, what does it have to do with anything? No, no, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm neglect. I'm neglect. I had uh, a busy weekend schedule, and I just didn't have time for it. I watched it the other night, just before I went to bed. So sorry. I took... Uh, did notes. it give you nightmares? You know, it did. It, you know what it did for me? I kept seeing Ian Lipkin's face over and over again. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven pages of notes here. Wow. Oh, uh, first, wow. first time I've taken notes on a movie. <laughs> and I, I watched it on my laptop so I could keep pausing it. You I know, actually watched cool. it. I, I just finally um, got a smartphone. I got the iPhone. And, and I watched it on my phone. Oh, brother. Which was an interesting experience, I have to say. You, once, <laughs> once you're about 10 minutes into it, it becomes, it becomes immersive. Huh. That's interesting. A phone is quite small, but you're young. Your eyesight is still good. <laughs> and it, it was a movie. I wasn't trying to read small text. So how should we do this? Shall we just go through it and chat, and we'll each uh, talk and interrupt each other, the usual business? Is that good? Sure. Does that work sure. for everyone? Yeah. All right. Let me just say at the outset... This is this is why I don't go to see science-based movies because I'm just too critical. The the general public will not pick up most of the criticisms I have at least, and for them it will be a fine movie anyway. So um, I, I look at it with too critical an eye. Overall, I didn't really like it. I felt none of the characters were well developed. In a movie, for me, you have to like one at least one of the characters. You have to identify, and I couldn't like any of them there was nothing compelling about any of them so for me my summary is the science is okay there were some errors but nothing that the public will notice and then the rest of it eh. you know i just really didn't care about matt damon most of the women got killed right away the one scientist which we'll see at the cdc who could have been a good character was just portrayed as an automaton cranking out data. And, uh, and who, who's I, that? I don't know any of these names. It's the woman who made the vaccine. <laughs> ah, ah, right. She did everything, basically. Right. That's the other thing. Right. Yeah. So there's, C- there's just CDC doing everything in this movie, pretty much. And that's totally unrealistic. Okay. Uh, Mostly- yeah, they had the one lab at, where was it, UCSF was he supposed to Supposedly, be Supposedly, yeah. Uh-huh. That was, Elliot Gould. Yeah, that the guy's name was Ian something, right? Right. Which I guess supposed to be Ian Lipkin. And so I found it really just not compelling for all those reasons. It just didn't grab me. The science didn't grab me. But everyone else can, of course. So before we dive into this uh, detail of a movie that I can't participate in in terms of the <laughs> conversation, uh, let me just suggest that we review very, 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 very briefly the history of of the portrayal of disease outbreaks by Hollywood. I wouldn't know anything about it. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. Well, what have f- I seen? I'm sure you saw Outbreak. 
I didn't see Outbreak. Oh, I saw Outbreak. Okay, with what Dustin, else? With Dustin Hoffman. That was a lame movie. Well, yeah, that was in, a lame exactly movie. right. It was a lame movie. When I'm, I want to go right back to a, an early documentary movie. It was a docudrama movie. It starred Paul Muni. Does anybody remember the name of that mm-hmm. movie? No, I know Paul Muni, though. No, he starred in The Life of Louis Pasteur. Oh. No. Well, that's not science fiction. <laughs> no, no, it's not science fiction. This but movie it, is science fiction, right? Uh, but, well, yes. But it had some touch in reality. Which, it, wh- where? No, no, I'm, I'm what, what, the a, uh, Outbreak movie? I didn't see Outbreak. The Outbreak movie had the Ebola outbreak as their basis. Yeah, out, the Outbreak movie was based on uh, Richard Preston's, uh, either his novel or his, um, his uh, kind of over-dramatized nonfiction book on Ebola. Right. But the uh, Paul Muni movie was about all kinds of diseases and the wine industry, and it, it really chronicled his life. But he had a lot of disease stuff in there, lots of rabies, lots of... Uh, things of that sort. It was a documentary. It was, but okay. it was a fictional documentary. Ian Lipkin said to me, convince contagion is not a documentary. No. Because I was complaining about it. No, of course not. It. Of course it's not. And so I just have issues with science movies. Now, when they do it on viruses, it's even more of an issue because I work on viruses. Okay? Right. And I want it to be correct, and it's not going to be, no matter how many advisors <laughs> they have. Right. And um, so I have issues. So the general public will like it. I don't. But let's start talking about it, okay? Sure. So this movie starts out with uh, the lady. By the way, by the way, this is going to contain spoilers if you haven't. Oh seen. yes, spoiler oh, yeah. alert! Spoiler alert! <laughs> so it starts out with the, the the character portrayed by Gwyneth Paltrow. What's the name of the character? Do we remember? Uh, Don't worry about I it. Actually, I actually agree with you that the characters were not particularly memorable. <laughs> so she's in Hong Kong, and she. I will get all their names up here. I'll you get, get them on the internet. It right. starts with with the. <laughs> Day two on the screen, so you know already that something's up. Day two, and she's in an airport. She's coughing. She's eating peanuts. She's swiping her uh, ATM card, and then they go to other people who are getting sick and hugging other people, Uh, and then uh, she gets home. This is day four now, right? She's Beth 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 Emhoff. Okay, so she gets home. Day four, she is looking terrible. She collapses in her kitchen. She starts foaming at her mouth. She has a seizure. They bring her to the hospital, and she dies. All right? Right. And so... Which, I have to say, she's not one of my favorite actresses. So seeing Gwyneth Paltrow gone in the first 10 minutes of the yeah. movie, that was a good sign. <laughs> but there's a lot of touching of people touching uh, you know, windows and poles and buses. Just give you this sense that there's um, contamination going on. Alan, right? I can all, tell you, go back and... the movie that's, uh, yeah. that's going on. These right. little... Little glimpses, close-ups of people touching stuff. Alan, go back and see Shakespeare in Love. You'll like Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> Serious. So I like the part where the do- so the husband of Beth is uh, played by Matt Damon, who I think is a completely forgettable character in this movie. In this there's, movie. There's just no reason to get into him at all. Um, the doc says, we don't know why she died. It could have been cephalitis, meningitis, West Nile, herpes. And he goes, she didn't have herpes. <laughs> right. <laughs> And then he says, the doctor finishes with all that stuff, and he says, yeah, so can I go talk to her? Yeah, Matt Damon says, can I go talk to her? He just doesn't get it. He's in complete denial. Yeah. So uh, I thought the doc went through some of the possible causes, but he didn't know what was going on. All All right. right. So then we move to day five. So now there's something going on. There's an outbreak. Uh, I think it starts, there's a scene at WHO, which I completely recognize because I've been there, headquarters in Geneva, so that was correct. Uh, they give you shots of uh, Hong Kong, Guangdong, which is where SARS outbreak began. They go to Chicago, and now this is where they live, uh, Beth and her husband, and they're sawing her skull open. So you see her face, and then the flap of her uh, um, skin on her head comes forward, and one of the doctors. So wait, no, wait, hang on, wait a minute. Yeah, what's that? What did she I miss? Coming, she was coming back from Hong Kong, right? You know that. Right. All right? And they didn't live in Chicago. They lived in Minnesota. Sorry, sorry, Minnesota. She Minnesota. stopped in Chicago. Minnesota. She stopped off in Chicago yeah, to, because to she's have, having uh, an affair with some yeah. guy, right? So, yeah. So she managed sorry, I forgot a little that. tryst on the way home. Yeah. Throw that so out. that deposits that leaves some virus in Chicago as we find out. That leaves a little <laughs> note in Chicago and yeah. later on she's back in Minnesota and now they're carving her up. Right. After her literal layover. Yes. 
So they're not they're the physicians who are sawing her skull open. <laughs> They just have face masks. Uh, Siskel know, and Ebert the clear, eat your heart out. The clear um, covering on their face, and one of them gets splattered with brain material. Yeah, nice sound effects in that too. There's this little sort of sploit. So <laughs> they're looking at it, and they and they're and all of a sudden they they expose the brain and they freak out. And one says to the other, "Move away," and um, he says, "Call everybody," but they don't say what they found. Right. You know, right. just by macroscopically looking at the brain, from, they don't for see dramatic it. effect. Dramatic effect. Yes. Everything okay so far? Everything yeah, and okay. I should I should say um, I was very I was very pleased with the cinematography. I thought the pacing and the editing and the yeah. and the shots uh, the setup for it was very good. Okay. I think um, that's fair. Yeah. And I, and I thought that the um, you know there's nothing scientifically wrong with the lead in and somebody dies of a mystery yeah, illness and okay. and you've got kind of the the rapid cuts from place to place and this is obviously an outbreak is going on and we don't know what and um, so it, it really I, I think um, Steven Soderbergh who was the the um, director did an excellent job setting the whole story up I uh, yeah I agree <clears throat> with that so far I have no problems um, now we go they put the husband in isolation and now we meet uh, the character portrayed by um, Kate Winslet Actually, by the time the husband's in isolation, uh, his younger son died. Has died. Right. That's right. He died. Uh, and he also has a daughter who uh, uh, has not has not been sick. Right. She visits him. I think first time we see her is when she shows up, and he's in isolation. So uh, uh, Kate Winslet goes to. Uh, she's an EIS officer. So she's sent by the CDC uh, to Minnesota, Minneapolis, where uh, Beth has died and so forth. And um, she's at, I think, a Department of Public Health in Minneapolis, and she's talking with some people. And one thing I like, they're going through the different possibilities, and they suggested enteroviruses. And she said, no, it's too cold for an enterovirus outbreak, which is, which is quite reasonable. Yep. And then they say, she says there have been 47 cases and eight deaths so far. However, on the board, on the whiteboard behind them, <laughs> there are cases and deaths that don't match that number. <laughs> oh, well. So some production assistant got it wrong. No. Just a minor detail. Um, they, she has on, then she starts talking about reproductive capacities, R noughts, right? Right. Which is basically uh-huh. how many people you yeah, can yeah. infect with. Yep being infected and it differs for each virus and she has on the board she has flu and she has smallpox she has polio and in much of the scene polio is behind her head so i thought that was a nice touch oh, by the way speaking of smallpox there is a wonderful movie about the outbreak of smallpox called black robe okay is that and your pick of the week it will be but there was another movie before that with vanessa redgrave about the plague which I also remembered now. So disease portrayal in Hollywood has been a big theme in some cases. Why don't you make a list now while we're talking? I will do that. Well, well there's also the entire zombie genre, which oh, is usually portrayed as a disease outbreak. <laughs> stop it. That's and a and tw- 12 Monkeys, which I think was Rich's pick last <laughs> yeah, week. Which last is week a, I was thinking I should have, if I didn't know we were going to do this this week, I would have saved 12 Monkeys for this week. But uh, Dixon's going to have a list. Three of them died now, between um, then and now. One thing that I noticed as she's talking to these Department of Health people, she's talking about a virus. So we're on day six now, and as far as I know, no one has figured out it's a virus yet. So right, I don't know but why they're she, already deciding that's the yes, virus. So well, she's got virus uh, R noughts on the board. You know, she's talking about intro. So I don't know why they they said that right away. Well, there's a lot of. There, there were several points in the film where they seemed to have reached scientific conclusions that they couldn't possibly have reached. Absolutely. At that point, Absolutely. you know, talking about the virus's uh, three-dimensional structure at a point when they can't culture it. Right. It, it's not right. going to happen. Right. <laughs> now, uh, next, the, the next thing I noted here, somebody is uh, giving a press release or something. Uh, so wait a minute. I want to. Yeah. I want to go back for a minute because. Uh, one of my gripes here, and this happens in a couple of places. I actually don't have very many gripes. Um, uh, I, uh, I agree with you that the, as a, as a movie, it wasn't really compelling. And, uh, I've, I actually watched it twice. I watched it in the theater and then, uh, last weekend I watched it again 
on on the computer in preparation for this. Um, uh, in, in neither case did I find the it really all that compelling as a movie. The second time around, I was, you know, since I knew what was going to happen, I was looking a little more closely at sort of the science and et cetera, and I approached it almost like a documentary. And from that point of view, it, uh, as a hypothetical situation of what might happen um i thought it was kind of interesting looking at it from a from the point of view of uh, this is uh, like a documentary what could happen i thought it was kind of interesting interestingly i didn't you know if you if you think about it if something like this really did happen anything close to this it would probably be pretty scary though i didn't find the movie frightening we're so used to being you know inundated with this horrific violence and stuff that some, some something even if it looks real that's really awful i mean doesn't doesn't really bother us at any rate this uh minnesota health department scene mm. was one that i thought was kind of it seemed to me contrived i i somehow it didn't seem to me that uh uh the scientist who with this was kate winslet should have to be explaining some of this, the stuff that she was explaining yeah, yeah. to the health department people. That's right. I would think that a lot of those people would, would know more than that. Yeah, so right. she's, she's mean, clearly there to explain it to the movie's audience. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay. But so, somehow yeah. they had to get that in there. And, <laughs> and have, you know, hey, if you're going to have somebody explain uh, uh, epidemiological concepts to you, Kate Winslet's a pretty good pick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they were, I, they were being resistant to her. They were saying, oh, how can we tell people this? But, and they're, they're public health people. They're not supposed to react that way. Right. Well, but there'd be in a, in a meeting like that, there would be people who would be responsible for the PR side of it mm -hmm. and who would be worried about exactly those issues. Yeah, we're not really clear on who yeah, those there was, people uh, are. There was yeah. one right. woman who was um, who was at that meeting who was really pretty much of a jerk about yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know, that's not realistic. She's a jerk. And then I thought again, and I thought, no, wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> well, she comes Anytime up later. Anytime get a committee together, <laughs> she comes, I mean, I made the there's going to be a couple of actually, jerks. Yeah, I, I made the assumption she was um, probably the, you know, the government representative on the public health committee. And, <laughs> and therefore, you know, didn't necessarily, uh, that those might be a political appointee, might be somebody who rose through the bureaucracy, didn't necessarily have public health training, but needed to sit in on this meeting because it was yeah, a... Yeah, that's probably... You know. She comes up later when they're setting up a triage area in a stadium, and right. she comes in and says, who's paying for this anyway, you or us? You know, so... Which is exactly <laughs> what would come up at that stage. In a, I, I thought sure. actually the... The disaster response aspects of it and the um, the human behavior aspects of the movie were very accurately portrayed. Uh, right, um, and, 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 and there's some and, of them and the political the political milieu in which this sort of thing happens. You know, if you look at any major disaster, exactly these sorts of conversations take place. Who's paying for all this? Yeah, right. And it seems to me that a, a, as a movie, there's really two sort of parallel themes going on. One is the science, which is what obviously we paid a lot of attention to, but the other are the social and political consequences and trying to imagine how that might play out. And it seems to me that they tried to hit several uh, different scenarios and, and portray them all. And I thought they did that in an interesting fashion. And I think uh, on, uh, maybe I'm over-interpreting this, but I think on some level Soderbergh probably intended it to be something of a 9-11 allegory. Uh yeah. You know, this is this is how a major disaster plays out, and the characters who we're watching in the movie are taking, uh, trying to take a very pragmatic approach to dealing with it. Which uh, I think his point is probably that that's the way these sorts of things should be dealt with, um, <clears throat> but but aren't necessarily always handled that way. Right. I don't know. Maybe that's over interpretation, but that was, uh, I, I think that may have been the filmmaker's intent. All right, at this point, I remember someone is giving a press conference and giving information. It's some guy. I don't remember where he was from. Um, he says it's chimeric in origin. That's all he says. Then he says the virus is 15 to 16 kilobases in length, which really bugged me. <laughs> all right, because uh, this is the kind of stuff that nobody cares about but me, but it's not the virus. It's the genome. Right? Oh, 
Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, day seven, we bring in the Department of Homeland Security and the whole bioterror angle. So, you know, somebody's got to suspect that this virus is a uh, creation. Right. So right. maybe it's a little sarcasm. I don't know. Uh, there was a great... Um, but there's a great uh, quote that comes out of that. Quote. Yes, Lawrence. so I got this written yes. down here. So uh, they, we probably all three saw the same thing. Yeah. With it. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the DHS guy, you know, says, "Can you weaponize bird flu, something like that?" And Fishburne says, "Birds are already doing that." Yeah, <sighs> someone doesn't have to weaponize a bird flu. The That's words right. are already yeah, doing that. That was good. I like that. Yeah, that was good. So then there's more footage of people on buses and so forth touching and coughing. And then we get back to the CDC and the young lady whose name I, I don't remember, but she's done a lot of the work uh, on this virus. She's now sequenced it. She says she's determined the structure of the virus, and she's got it up there on a, on a monitor, and she's rotating it. But so, they still can't culture it. Still can't culture it. Later on, in about five minutes, she complains that she can't culture it and she can't do any work on it. Yet they've done all this stuff, so something got mixed up here. But again, the public will not notice this. Um, uh, she's, the, one of one of the problems I had with not being able to culture it is they say uh, it kills every cell yeah. we infect it with, and that that's crap. that didn't make any sense to me. No, that's you know? ridiculous. If you can't culture something, usually you add it to cells and nothing happens. Right. If it's in fact, killing you, want it, something is happening. It's yeah. a virus. You want it to kill every, every cell right. that you, yeah, yeah that, that's that, bad. you successfully cultured it. Yeah. Um, at this point, she says, it, they're looking at the sequence, and she says, look, it contains both bat and pig sequence. Again, this really pisses me off. It does not have bat and pig sequence. It may have sequence from a bat virus and a pig virus, which is what they mean, but please say what you mean. All right, so then she shows a model way, of the virus. The, the, uh, the, doc, the CDC doc that you like is uh, uh, Dr. Allie Hextall. Hextall. Okay. Uh, and she is played by, uh, I'm sorry, I lost it here. Uh, yes, uh, Jennifer Ailey, E H L E. So this person had no character whatsoever. Now, I know a lot of scientists. She's a scientist. Nah, come on. Scientists all have characters. <laughs> we have no re idea of what's pushing her, what's motivating her. All she does is spew out data. No character whatsoever. So then she shows us this virus structure, which is, in fact, the structure of a glycoprotein bound to a cell receptor, which they have apparently identified. And she says the receptors are on the respiratory tract and CNS cells. I don't know of what organisms and how they figured that out. We're only on day seven here. And, of course, you can't culture the virus. So I don't know how they got all this. But, again, the public won't get any of this, right? They don't care. Uh, uh, the only thing that bothered me about that was she said it, it's – here's, here's a model of the virus. Yeah. And it wasn't it's a model the virus, of the virus. Yeah. It was a model of a couple but of But there's no way in seven days they would have the receptor. There's just no way. It takes at least a year. Right. right. The, the science, for the sake of the movie, the science had to develop much, much faster than yeah, sure. science actually developed. But also, um, I, I, you know, for the sake of the movie, the virus is, I, I think, a combination of pathogenic and transmissible that is not likely to ever arise in nature in in a respiratory virus. I, I found the virus itself a little unbelievable. Yeah, I don't know why it had to be a hybrid between a, a bat virus and a pig virus. Well, they needed example. an interesting story to show how it originated. Yeah. No, Nipah. Yeah. They were basing that on Nipah. Nipah is not a hybrid of a bat virus no, and a pig but they, virus. No, and I, I know that. Right, know so where does it come from? But pigs and bats gathered yeah. together in the mango. Yeah, yeah they, they, needed, they needed some kind of backstory there, but okay. I, I felt, you know, this is, this is not a virus. This is not a, 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 a zoonotic outbreak that you yeah. typically see. Usually a zoonotic disease is either, um, you know, it's going to be really, really fatal, but it's not going to transmit very well, or um, you know, you're not going to be too worried about it. Well, they were uh, then they were also doing the influenza bit on that too, right? Yes, uh, melt. Yes, right. They're basically mixing up uh, uh, exactly. flu and flu and yeah. Nipah. That's right. That's right. Right. So this is this is not a virus we're ever going to see, or a, or a scenario we're ever necessarily going to see. It's got to be a little bit removed from reality in order to make a good movie. <laughs> 
Um, and, I, and I think the pace of the science follows along with this. You know, you're not going to see a respiratory virus that's transmitted to the waiter who comes by to pick up your glass necessarily right. that's also deadly to 20% of the people who get it. Um, but you're, you're also not going to find the receptor in a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, part of the, yeah, so part of the idea here is this is a respiratory transmitted virus that gets into your brain and causes encephalitis. So that's why they put the receptor on respiratory cells and brain cells. It makes sense for them. Sure. So she is talking to Fishburne, who's some head guy at CDC. And uh, they come up with this 20% mortality rate, which I'm sure is bogus because they have no idea how many people are infected because they don't have a serology test yet. Right Here, this is a little contrived as well because I had a feeling that uh, it's uh, us, she right? shouldn't have to explain to him some of this stuff. Oh, yeah. He, and, ought, and, he ought to know some. And then at one point he says, and there's no vaccine available, right? Come on. It's, just, it's day seven. So, Vince, this would be a good time to segue into a little pause. And tell the audience that isn't probably aware of how these things are calculated, yeah. what is the difference between prevalence and case fatalities? Tell us, Dixon. No, you tell us. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you say there's no serological survey, assuming that there is a serological survey now. So you do the serological survey on a population and you find that uh, you find, let's say for the West Nile virus that first came to New York City, there were seven deaths. And I, I'm blocking on how many cases, but there might have been 60 cases altogether. But when they did the Sura survey in Upper uh, Manhattan and Lower Bronx, they found 8,000 potential positive cases of infection with no disease. Right. So if you were to say, what is the prevalence of this infection, you'd have to take the 8,000 infections and compare them to 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. You'd say out of 100,000 people, yeah. 8,000 people got infected. Right. But if you say, what is the case rate for West Nile virus, you'd have to take the 8,000 that got infected and say the 60 people that came to the hospital, then you use that as a percentage. And then finally, what is the case fatality rate? And so of the number of people that came into the hospital, how many of those people died? Now, we're having problems with those numbers in the, in the popular press. And I know that Vince has come in every morning and he has less and less hair because he's been pulling it out the night before, struggling with the New York Times and other august publications that, 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 that says, says stuff that's not really true. Right. Like 90% fatality rate for the H5N1 strain of virus. Uh, that's not the case at all. That's how many people died who got sick. Right. How many people actually got infected but didn't get sick? And the, the, the public will say, well, nobody. Nobody doesn't get infected and not get sick. There's no difference, but there's a huge difference. So I think we should say this openly and frankly. There's a huge difference between infection and disease. Those were the first two things I learned when I came here as a student. And those are the only things that I haven't forgotten. <laughs> so, so that's a good thing to keep track inc of. Incidence is the new cases. is a measure of the new cases. Right. And prevalence is how many people at one point Get have infected it. over the total population. Yeah, exactly. Of right. Exactly. Okay. So by this point now they have uh, 89,000 cases. They've determined that the reproductive index is 2. So every infected person can infect two others. And here's the conversation about not being able to grow it and killing the cells right away. And then she says, we can't vaccinate against it because we can't grow it. Well, actually, that is not the reason you can't vaccinate against it because on day eight, you don't know what you need to be immune. Right. You don't know what the immunological correlates of, of, yeah. of protection are. You could use a glycoprotein from the virus to immunize, but you don't know if that's going to give you the protection. But Vince, didn't need. they grow it anyway? Didn't they grow it in cells? Not yet, though. Eventually. Eventually, right. yeah. Dr. E.N. Sussman. Oh, okay. Uh, eventually, you know, this is a very interesting part. You can see the hand of E.N. Lipkin here. <laughs> he, the lady at CDC says, we tried immunological knockout cell lines, but they didn't work. But Dr. Sussman tried a bat lung cell line, and it worked. Uh huh. Right, and that was after the CDC told him to stop working on it because they felt it was too dangerous. <laughs> right, right. So they decided they wanted everything done at BSL four, and he was. And, all and I actually, I actually That's thought right. that was a particularly realistic part of the movie. 
Yeah, and I, I so liked him too. I mean, not he's listening to <laughs> not listening to the <laughs> official instructions. He goes back into the lab. He's got to do one more experiment because, right. of course, you would. And he finds that he can grow it in this particular cell line. Huh. Uh, I like. Uh, I I, I kind of liked his character too. He was sort of. He was sort of frazzled, you know, when he's when he's in his office and they call him to shut him down. Okay, you hear this phone ringing. He's got to scramble through a pile of papers to find his cell phone. Right? <laughs> Who was the actor? Yeah, it was uh, Elliot, Elliot Gould. Gould. Elliot Gould, of course. Um, so then eventually uh, Larry Fishburne finds out that he did this experiment. He's pissed off. He slams the table and he said, he's going to publish it. I thought that was a great stab at the NSABB, <laughs> even though it hadn't happened at the time they made this movie. At this point, we find out that the name of the virus is MEV1. Now, I don't know what that stands for. Does anyone? I think the the storyline eventually tells us it originated in Macau, right? Macau encephalitis virus? So, I assumed it was Macau encephalitis virus. Okay. <clears throat> at this point, many, many people throughout the world are being briefed about this virus, and there is a scene there with Ian Lipkin staring at a slide showing infection of bat cells with this virus. Everybody saw that, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. All right, day 14. Uh, we got more pictures of how this stuff gets transmitted. They're in a casino showing how people who died in the beginning of the movie were interacting with each other and spreading it. I found that kind of uninteresting at this point. A bunch of clips of stuff. Uh, and now this lady from WHO comes to um, to Hong Kong, I guess. Right. Remember uh, her? Sure, to Macau, I think. Macau. And she gets films from the casino. And from looking at these people, she figures out the chain of infection by just seeing who's touching whom. Which, Look, I'm not an epidemiologist, but you would just look at a movie and say, this person spread it to this. I mean, she put on a chart on the wall, the chain of transmission. I thought you had to do more than just see people touching each other. Yeah, a little unrealistic watching the film, and she sees the waiter pick up the glass and says, that's transmission. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, my bigger problem with that was, that this is silly, but my bigger problem with that, and I have this problem lots of times when they do this, is all that footage was supposed to be coming off a security camera, right? Right. Yeah. And yet they had all sorts of close-ups and different <laughs> angles and this yeah. kind of stuff. That's a hell of a security camera. That's more like right. a replay on an NFL game. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, the, the lighting was amazing for a security camera. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is this was, actual, this was what was actually happening, and she's looking presumably at the grainy security camera video footage. But uh, I, would say, uh, I, I would say, however, that the notion – that you would try and uh, identify the index case by um, looking at security uh, camera videos from a casino or something like that was, I don't know if you'd actually do that, but it was an interesting idea to me. Sure. Yeah, I think, I think probably if you, were, if you were the epidemiologist who was looking into that, you'd want to know how did these people come in contact. Sure. I mean, trying to identify the index case is, is I, I guess, important. Sure. So we're at day 14 now. Uh, One scene I thought you would like, Rich, uh, Fishburne is talking to an army guy in his office, and on the board it's written Vaccinia. (laughs) Oh, jeez, I didn't catch that. You really watched this. Red letters on the whiteboard. I'm going to have to go watch it again (laughs) for a third time. (laughs) About this point they bring in this this video blogger uh, played by Jude Law. Right. And he's got, you know, he says it's all conspiracy, and he comes up with an antidote for Scythia, which causes panic in the world. And, you know, this goes throughout the movie. I, I personally found this character totally uninteresting. But I found him actually very realistic, and yeah. I think I think making a really good point. Absolutely. I think he's an important element in the film. That when you have when you have any kind of breakdown in official structure, shysters are going to rush in and or a perceived breakdown, shysters are going to rush in and capitalize on it, and they're they're going to do exactly that sort of thing. Well, heck, we deal with a certain amount of this all the time on Twiv, right? Yeah. <laughs> trying to trying to um, quell this sort of nonsense. Rich, you're breaking up. Yeah, by can the way. you unplug and quell ah. the, quell that? <laughs> are you back? I'm back. Well, I'm just too cynical. That's why. I, I agree with your points, but I just thought he could go away. 
Yes. So there's another there was another great quote yeah. that came out of the interaction with him that I thought of Alan when <laughs> this was going on. I sh- Blogging is not writing. Yes. Yeah. It's <laughs> graffiti with punctuation. Right. Yeah. Corporations yeah. are not people. Yeah, that was good. I remember that. I was going to write that down too. Um, day 21, the lady from the CDC. What did we say her name was again? Uh, I'll get it back here. She comes breathlessly out of a lab. She says, it's mutated. And this yes. really <laughs> bugs me above anything yeah. else. Because as everyone knows... Everything is mutating. It's always mutating. Now, she says it's got a new reproductive index. It's gone to four because it moved into an HIV population in Africa, and now it's more mm. infectious. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. No. No way. Uh, she is Dr. Allie Hextall. Right. Allie. Okay, Allie. I'm sorry. But I can't right. remember Played any of these Played by Jennifer names. Ailey. Ailey. Right. Oh, yes. Right, and, and if the virus is spreading better, it is my money would be on it losing some pathogenicity. Does, does the sure. credit shows who, sure. show who wrote this, by the way? Yeah, it does, but we don't know who that is. It's just a screenwriter. There were three senior scientific advisors, Ian Lipkin, I, Laurie Garrett, and someone else I don't remember. Right, writing, writing credit is, um, primary writing credit is Scott Burns. So now we're up to day 26, two and a half million deaths in the U.S., and... Um, She's talking about a vaccine now. So now we're actually coming up around Christmas time. And she says, we tried a killed vaccine and it didn't work. They have a monkey model now that they can use to test it. And she says, now we we tried it with adjuvants and it didn't work. And this is day 29, folks. It takes two weeks to get an immune response before you can challenge. So it's compressed, as Alan says. Yeah. She says, we're going to have to do a live vaccine, a live attenuated vaccine. And then all of a sudden, she's got racks of vials of live attenuated vaccines. We don't know how she made them live attenuated. Break out the ferrets. <laughs> yeah, I, they weren't ferrets, but they were cute little macaques. Mm-hmm. And uh, one day, one monkey is alive. One monkey, and it's been inoculated with vaccine number 57. Right. And so I don't know how. I hope she did more than one monkey. Yeah. <laughs> But she takes a syringe full of this stuff and inoculates herself in the thigh. That's gutsy. Which is realistic. I don't know. I, I think, yeah. The doctors you do know, that if, a lot. It, there's a long history of people, of, of researchers testing stuff on themselves. That's true. Um, and in a, you know, in a situation, I, as I say, I don't think there would be a situation quite that dire. Um, but in a situation even remotely similar to that, I, yeah, absolutely. The problem uh, is that I, her character is so undeveloped, I have no reason to believe that she would do this. Yeah, there's no reason to believe she would or wouldn't yeah. because you don't even know who she is. Right, exactly. They do, however, in the – so she – after she uh, shoots herself up, she goes and visits her father, who apparently was a doctor, who's in – uh, the hospital dying of this thing and uh, deliberately exposes herself to him and uh, in the process recounts how he told her about uh, the guy who studied, who discovered uh, Heliobacter as a cause of ulcers Helico. doing the experiment on himself. Barry Marshall. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, there's a Which history he of this. Did. Okay, the pick of the week for me. <laughs> It's a we'll book. get to it. <laughs> I, I will. I'm going to write this down right now. Um, so that was nice, and he said to her, you know, he won a Nobel Prize, and she smiled. And the first time we realized that she wants a Nobel Prize, and they get a little motivation out of her. <laughs> Personally, if he's a physician, Doc Rich, I don't think he would know that story. Oh, I okay. think a lot of physicians nah, know that I story. I don't think so. <laughs> but it's just crap. You know why? Because then when they finally uh, distribute the vaccine, it's an intranasally administered vaccine. Right, so, I wondered about it. So what that. the hell is she putting it in her thigh for with yeah. a needle? All right. So uh, they More really fast-track this vaccine, apparently. By one, by day 131, uh, they, they're starting to have a lottery to distribute it. So let's see. She tested on herself on day 29. So there was a lot of testing there involved, but nowhere near as much as you would have for a normal vaccine. 
but that's okay. By now I we would have imagine, I would imagine that in this case there would be a lot of fast tracking, yeah. genuine sure. social fast tracking. So we've got supposedly 26 million deaths, which is just non. This is just ridiculous. It's just not happening. But it's okay. It's a movie. Yeah. At this point, um, the vlogger guy starts complaining about vaccine side effects like narcolepsy, autism. He brings in swine flu and Guillain-Barre. So, you know, all the buzzwords here. So he's serving a purpose to underscore what you said earlier, Alan. About yeah, he's, I, I think actually his character is, is probably the most developed and believable um, in the film. And I really appreciated that they included him. And then uh, I read one of the vaccine packages. It's a, it was it said monovalent intranasal. So I guess they determined that there was I don't know just one serotype or more than right. one. I don't know. They didn't tell us anything about that. But it mutated, Vince. <laughs> <It's a> mutate. <laughs> Wait a minute, man! Don't tase me. <laughs> and that's merely about it, except for the last few scenes. Any anything before we get to that that you guys want to bring up? Uh, I just have one more quote that I liked um, at one point <clears throat> Matt Damon's uh, in his house and ah, that's right he sees somebody breaking into the house across the street so he calls 911 yes. and he gets this message that says says a bunch of stuff in the menu up front but one of the things was to report a death or for removal of a body mm-hmm. please press 1 <laughs> uh, that was pretty good yeah actually the I thought the most compelling part was when his daughter who he's he's now shut up you know for 140 days in his house she gets to have a little prom in her own house with her boyfriend because they can't go out i mean i thought that was the first time the movie got about a character you know right which i thought was nice so at the end what we we see we go back to hong kong and we see the lady beth she's shaking hands with a chef and then they backtrack to a a tropical area where a bulldozer is knocking down palm trees. Bats are flying around. One of them roosts in a pig farm, uh, defecates or urinates on a pig, and they take that pig eventually and they bring it to the restaurant in Hong Kong, and the chef is stuffing the mouth of the pig before cooking, and then he wipes his hands on his shirt and goes to shake her hand. And so that is apparently how she got the virus. Right. So that's a kind of, as we've already discussed a kind of a combination of things okay so it's kind of a combination of nipa and flu correct because the notion that um you can basically aggravate zoonoses by displacing creatures from their natural habitat and forcing them to say uh roost in a man-made dwelling Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's not an unreasonable idea and the notion uh uh, that in the case of flu or something like that, you can get a reassortment in an intermediate host, or in any zoonosis, right. a, uh, a, a, a transfer. Well, I, that's the definition of zoonosis from a, a bat to a human, is um, is okay. Right. But of course, they've sort of cooked all that up together and yeah. accelerated yeah. it to make it into the movie. So this, yeah, but uh, given given the constraints of making an entertaining movie. Um, I think this is probably about the best case scenario for keeping the the science as accurate as you can while still keeping a thriller moving ahead. Right. And I think a lot of the flaws with character development stem from the same issue. It's a, it's a genre film. It's a thriller. And so you need fast pacing. You need a lot of characters. And a lot of the script is going to be almost writing itself. Uh, there's not a huge amount of room for... Um, for character development in that setting. I don't know. There have been some thrillers with Matt Damon where you get much more character development than True, this one, where right? he's where he's the central focus. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So one one or two characters you can do that, I suppose. Right. We should point out that the virus is a par- is supposed to be a paramyxovirus and that's of course what Nipah and Hendra viruses mm-hmm. are, and these are viruses that went from bats to either pigs or horses and then humans. Uh, in Asia and have caused some disease, but of course they have not transmitted well uh, among people, as this virus MEV1 apparently has. Right. Uh, A couple of other things uh, besides what I've said. 
So again, I, I thought the idea that the CDC basically did everything is is unrealistic because, as we know, CDC is not always able to do everything. They do. Uh, I think the the other scientists in the world were excluded. I mean, in the in the SARS outbreak, scientists all over the world participated in figuring this out, not just one place. And this didn't reflect that at all. Well, the Sussman character is kind of supposed to be representative of that. I think. Yeah, it's one guy and. He hardly yeah. does anything. Though. It's a movie, though. <laughs> You've got to suspend a little bit of reality. I know, but that's my problem. I can't when it's so close to home. That, of that's course. The problem. Yeah. Um, and also, very little information about communication. You know, in the SARS epidemic, we had a lot of communication using ProMed Mail and online right. sources among scientists, giving the sequence back and forth. And a lot of people contributed that. And there's nothing. But maybe the most important part is that there's no one character built as a scientist that you could really believe in and feel they're motivated to do something and understand what drives them. And it's just, uh, you know, this woman spewing out the data just didn't cut it, I thought. But yeah. I could see the hand of Ian Lipkin in this, and so I think he did a good job. Yes. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people like it. I just don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we actually have a bunch of comments from uh, some listeners that we've been... Saving up, so let's read those. The first yeah, is from, and, and I should say, yeah. I, I did actually enjoy the movie. Okay, I, I thought it was a, kind of a fun ride. Rich, did you Rich, enjoy it twice? Rich. Yeah, I enjoyed he it. Liked it. I enjoyed the movie. It wasn't, you know, it's not on my uh, top pick list, uh, but I enjoyed it. It was interesting, and I thought that despite all of the issues that we uh, have identified, uh, they got a lot of the science right. It's a, it's it's a lot closer than. Uh, a lot of other uh, sci-fi movies. So you give it a B. You give it about a, a B plus or an A. Sure, I'll give it a. I'll give it a B or a B plus. Sure. There you go. That's good enough. Uh, uh, can you plug and unplug again? I'm sorry. Ah, this must be my <laughs> computer. It's the USB chipset in that uh, ah. headset. Our first email is from Joe, who writes Twivers. I did the home. Hey, I did the homework Professor Vince a- assigned and went to see the movie Contagion. I really liked the movie and was very pleased with the way the science was portrayed. I am an environmental health and safety manager for a biotech company and started listening to Twiv about two and a half years ago, when I was researching avian flu and pandemic response planning about six months before it hit the headlines. As someone who had to consider all the social impacts and mitigation measures so I could write a response plan, I thought the movie hit just the right tone with the various stages of panic, denial, fear-mongering, and good public health science going on in the background. They touched on the emotional impacts of losing loved ones, quarantine zones, panic buying, looting, and becoming self-reliant very well. I like that the science was done by a number of people within their own specialties and not by a single hero protagonist which I disagree with, by the way. <laughs> I appreciated that they created a slimy huckster fear-mongering the uninformed to fill the bill of a Wakefield charlatan who gets his in the end, yeah. I can't speak to accuracy of the details of virus isolation and vaccine development. The only part that seemed weak to me scientifically was at the end when they showed the case zero details. It seemed to me that the woman got exposed to a cook with a virus on his hands. Then somehow she contaminated all these other people by touch, even though she was not yet producing the virus herself. This seems like a fairly small nit to pick when it was just an issue of time compression. If they had shown her two days after getting it from the chef when she was just about to have symptoms, then it would have been more credible. Very good movie. I may use this as a training tool once I can get it on DVD. Thanks for everything that you all do. Great. I think that touches on a lot of the things that we brought up. Yeah. Uh, Alan, would you like to take the next one? Sure. Uh, Alex writes, Finally, I'm glad to see that the movie Contagion didn't fall under TWIV's radar as it was selected as a weekly pick in TWIV 148. I thought it might help stimulate some conversation on on things that I picked up during the course of the movie. Uh, the following contains spoilers, so I suggest you view the movie before reading further. Of course, at this point in the episode, you've already hit the spoilers. Um, about halfway through the movie, we become aware that Matt Damon's character was probably exposed to the virus but did not exhibit symptoms, by most accounts immune to the virus. They hold him in a containment cell for several days, but eventually he's released. If this was a real-world epidemic, would they hold him for longer? Really, with a novel virus like that, the health officials will have no idea how long he could have sequestered the virus within him. Do you have any idea what the CDC protocol is for a situation like this? 
I guess it was done for the movie. They had to let him out. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know what the CDC protocol would be. And I, I had issues with this as well. I didn't. It wasn't clear to me how they knew that he was immune or and as I, they said i think immune and he had something about could you use my serum and that uh, was shades of outbreak right so where if, they had one guy with antibodies and yeah. immunized the whole world and but it wasn't clear to me whether he was immune or resistant yeah or what was going on there, well he could have right? been infected by his wife but didn't get sick right that's a possibility. In which case, that was, it's also and, possible that for some reason he's resistant. Yeah, of course. Okay, I would think that they would do a virus ch- isolation before letting him go, right? Look in serum or respiratory secretions to make sure he's virus free. But that's a detail that you couldn't just deal, take in the movie at this point. I think. Yeah, and I I made the assumption that um, you know we're we're supposed to believe that they had by that point figured out the incubation period. Right, um, that, that's the most plausible explanation. Well, she, and, if you, yeah. and if you figured out the incubation period and you leave the guy contained yeah, for yeah. some days beyond that, then you should be that's fine. A, that, in fact, that's what they did. So um, Kate Winslet said we can let him out because the incubation period is 10 days and he's already beyond that. So right. that was the logic there, yeah. Uh, so, okay, next, uh, in regards the, to the epidemic shelter set up after the virus was in full swing, it seemed like a terrible way to manage an airborne virus, placing patients in close uh, proximity to one another with little or no barrier between them. If you look at real-life pictures of stadium shelters set up in the past, like those of the Astrodome during Hurricane Katrina, it would take a matter of hours for a virus with an airborne, um, with an r naught um, of two or greater to completely overwhelm the entire stadium. I attempted to brainstorm ideas for managing containment of a virus when there is suddenly an influx of 100,000 people infected but came up empty. It does seem like stadiums are a poor choice, however. It's clear that it's best to catch these types of outbreaks early. Um, I think think the idea of that was it was supposed to be – initially they said triage, but I think the idea was that it it was supposed to be an isolation ward. Yeah, you get get those people away from everybody else. Right, so it wasn't so much, you're not concerned about it spreading because the only people you're going to put in there are infected. Right. Exactly. And then the staff that was walking around was all bubbled up. Right. Uh, okay, next. As the investigation of where the virus uh, started progressed, a, who, a WHO official reviews the videos from the casino and determines Gwyneth Paltrow's character as the originating, originating case. She is viewed blowing on the other executive's casino chip for good luck, which the WHO official views as transmission. If you take a look at Paltrow's dress at this time, it's red and sparkling. We know from the camera pictures which Matt Damon views that Paltrow received the virus from the chef via a handshake who was actively preparing a pig moments before on the same night because she's wearing the same dress. How could she, how could she have transmitted the virus through her breath? Seems to me the virus would first have to become established within her respiratory tract before, she could be, uh, <laughs> before it could be transmitted to the other executive. Uh, I find the other two examples of transmission, handling a phone and a used glass, much more likely. Yeah, I think that is a weak point. Yeah, sure. But they could have. Why couldn't they fix the script to just have her, you know, get the virus and then two days later transmit it? I don't understand, but that's reasonable. Yeah. Um, Final final point. uh, At the end of the at the very end of the movie, we get a chance to um, we get a glance of how actual virus mutation occurred. A bulldozer plows through a forested area, disturbing a bat, who then goes to bite a pig. The virus then progresses into humans. Do you think global deforestation and habitat encroachment is leading to an increase in these unfavorable interactions and is thus putting us at an increased risk for an epidemic or or a mutated strain? On a smaller scale, I think there's evidence to support this theory. Take, for example, the Ebola outbreak in uh, Mayabu Gabon in 1996, where two men butchered a dead monkey they'd found leading to the spread of the virus. I think there's actually fairly good evidence that increased human contact with um, with what we refer to as edge areas uh, along the edge of a forest or edge of ecotones. some e- e- ecotones. Thank you very much. Um, right. Increased human contact with those is is a major factor in here, here. emerging infections. Well, the Nipah virus uh, scenario is exactly that. They'll clear an area of forest, plant mango trees, which are very fast growing. They attract bats. They also use pigs to to eat the rotten ones. And uh, so every time a bat comes down to pick up a, a mango that just fell on the ground, the pig comes over and chases it off. And just before that, of course, the bat defecates. 
and then flies off, leaving the Nipah virus in place. The pig eats the mango, and the next thing you know, the pigs are sick, and the farmer doesn't want to lose all his pigs, so he takes them to the market. Hmm. And that's how the Nipah virus gets started. The, the bat didn't By yellow, bite. Yellow no, the bat, didn't, the bat didn't bite the pig in the movie. It, okay. it um, pooped on the pig. Okay. The, the uh, epidemiology of yellow fever is exactly that, by the way. Uh, yes, the edge right. effect is absolutely spectacular with regards to it. Right, and if you look at maps of how development is occurring, particularly in well, actually in the developed world too, but particularly in developing <laughs> countries, yeah. Um, yeah. you see you see the the network of roads and uh, and whatever other transportation is being used spreads out like the like alveoli in a lung. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like biological structures that maximize <laughs> edge because of course. What you're looking at are things like logging roads, sure. where you want to maximize the amount of edge because that's how you get the trees out. Yeah, that's right. Uh, when they built the roads uh, to Brasilia in uh, Brazil, uh, the workers that worked on that project all came down with various forms of uh, leishmaniasis that had never been discovered before. They were all zoonotic, and they're now up to about 50 different uh, species of leishmania as the result. Every time you encroach into those systems, something new pops out. Okay, Rich. So Lance writes, I saw a contagion recently and was a contagion recently and was disappointed. They figure out the incubation period within a week too fast, I think. They seem to have a crystal structure, which was a protein, not a virus, before the virus was grown in cell culture, impossible. It's odd to have the genome and to have a genome that varies between 14 and 19 kilobases, variation of over 20% in size. <laughs> and lastly, if I could count a, calculate an R0 from sequence alone, I would be rich. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Oh, very good. So Lance is all over this. That's, uh, that's good. Way to go, Lance. Why don't you take the next one too, Rich? Okay. Uh, Thomas writes, hey, gang. So, I have yet to see Contagion, but with my birthday coming up, I figured I would dip, dig deep into my graduate school empty pockets and scratch <laughs> for the cash to treat myself this weekend. However, with its release, I was very interested in how reliable and how true this movie remained to science. Well, I did what any student would do uh, uh, to find such information, and I Googled it and came across this website, uh -huh. Script PhD. Um, and so I guess that has the script. It has reviews of science movies. Ah, that's right. It had the reviews of the science movies. Uh, I, I read that. I was interested in what your thoughts are on this site, and I especially hope you will consider a Contagion Review podcast because by the sounds of the reviews, <laughs> this movie is a great representation of a possible threat. Also, the editor of the website, uh, Giovanna uh, Grubick, Ph.D., Seems to be well trained, and I love the timing. Uh, I love the timing of this website's beginning, very shortly after the Twif, Twif podcast began. Any friendly or collegial connection there? Nonetheless, thank you all. Thank you and all your guests and co-hosts for the excellent work in bringing the best of virology and microbiology and parasitology to your faithful listeners. I look forward to your comments and future uh, podcasts. Regards, Thomas, who is uh, an MD candidate at George Washington University. Nice. So uh, I looked at this script PhD site. Uh, I have uh, since sort of forgotten about it. But yes, it, as I recall, it mostly, it said eh, the science was okay and then went on to mostly uh, talk about whether or not the movie was compelling or whatever and had a lot of the same criticisms that Vince had. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know this uh, person at all. There's no connection between us and, and her website, Thomas. Uh, the next one is from Nina. First off, love the show. It makes a great alternative to listening to the radio at my desk. You <laughs> bet. We're better than the radio. Do you think you could combine my two favorite topics, microbiology and the movies, by discussing the movie Contagion? That there is, if you haven't already, keep up the great work, Nina. Yes, there you go, Nina. Yes, I just, think we should do that. I just got it this, <laughs> this week, actually, so I thought we could read it. And then, Alan, you sent an update on the Schmallenberg virus. Ah, uh, yes. Um, this is an article in Science that just came out. And um, 
apparently this is uh, this outbreak which originally started in cows in November is now spread to sheep and goats and has shown up at dozens of farms in the Netherlands and bless you do you have schmallenberg virus <laughs> no he's got I contagion I done, whatever I done the PCR. one <laughs> what's the r0 figure it out by uh, intensity of your sneeze dixon yes you should be able to smell the r0 oh stop it <laughs> Apparently, it's considered a serious threat to animal health in Europe. Now, this is very interesting. The scientists are sharing the virus and protocols to help in studying the disease. That How makes can that sense. Be? How can it? that be? Well, this makes perfect sense, and this is why you should not interfere with publication and interaction and research. That's right. See, that's a, bless you. The genome has been sequenced. It's an orthobunia virus. I think we knew that last time. So we will put what vector species is transmitting it. We don't know. Can animals infect each other directly? And where did it come from are some of the questions uh, that are being addressed. And we don't know, of course, whether it can infect Probably humans. some cow hanging out at a casino. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Think they should make a movie about this, Rich? Absolutely. That's utter ridiculous. All right. <laughs> uh, we have a couple of follow-ups from our last episode. One of them is from Roberto Catania, who is the lead author on one the paper we discussed uh, describing the epithelial cell receptor for measles virus. He writes, thanks for enthusiastically discussing the measles virus host exit receptor in the breaking and entering TWIV 166. When SSPE was considered, the impression was that measles virus is gone when symptoms occur. However, there's a lot of virus in brain autopsies. One to 4,000 copies of nucleocapsid per average cell were documented by quantitative northern blots, and he gives a citation for that. By the way, biased hypermutation of viral genomes, up to 50% of the U residues in one gene mutated to C, was discovered in 1988 in autopsy material of an SSPE patient. On a personal note, after graduating in 1984, I joined the laboratory of Martin Billiter in Zurich, Switzerland. Martin was a bacteriophage Q beta virologist who just started working on a eukaryotic RNA virus, measles. The project was of great interest to me because of SSPE, the ultimate example of long-term persistence of an RNA virus. Martin had access to SSPE autopsy material through the group of Volker Termulin in Würzburg. Oh, yes. I was hoping to be able to clone and analyze measles virus genomes that had replicated for 5 to 10 years in the same person. In retrospect, ignorance was my luck. More insightful colleagues were scared by the perspective of working with minimal amounts of viral materials, if any. However, there was a lot of viral mRNA in these autopsy materials. Piece of cake project. <laughs> Great. Thanks again for discussing my favorite virus. By the way, uh, uh, Termulin is a collaborator with Michael Katz. In the old days, that's where SS, That's where I learned about SSP, just from secondhand information that I heard. Yeah, I think it was my um, incorrect statement that the virus was gone, and it's not. I mean, right, I don't it's think basically a, basically a persistent infection, except right. that the virus sort of uh, evolved to the point where it's defective. That's in right. SSP. Right. Exactly. So Michael rescued exactly. it from the tissues. That's what he did down at the uh, uh -huh. Wistar. Um, Alan, the next one. Sure. Uh, Kardec writes, I very much enjoyed listening to the latest TWIV podcast that inclu includes a discussion of our paper about Ebola, vi Ebola virus entry in NPC1. I just wanted to clarify that the proteins Ebola and HCV need, NPC1 and NPC1-like 1, respectively, are in fact different but related proteins. They are paralogs. They're about 50% similar. They are both cholesterol transporters, but are expressed in different cells and are regulated differently. NPC1 is present in all cells. NPC1, like one, is present only in gut epithelial cells and liver hepatocytes. We know that Ebola doesn't need NPC1, like one, at all. Also, Zetia azetamide, um, <laughs> there we go again, blocks NPC1, like one, but has no effect on NPC1, which is why we didn't use it in our experiments. Isn't this cool? So we have 
two of the PIs on the two of the four pa- five papers we discussed email us after listening to the episode. Yeah, yeah. that's terrific. And this is a really important clarification. I'm really yes. glad to see yes. this because I was confused uh, in particular about the distribution bit because it seemed like from the two papers that the pro- they were describing a different distribution for the two proteins. But now I understand that yeah. they're, in fact, two different proteins. How could uh, you possibly mix up two proteins named NPC1 <laughs> and NPC1 like one? Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, this is important that we uh, – right. yeah. it's cool yeah. that <clears throat> people are – the authors are listening to this stuff, and it's really important that they uh, straighten us out when we uh, get yes. stuff wrong. That's good. I'm, I'm frankly surprised that the authors listen, but it's great. Uh, this one, Kartik is is uh, Kartik Chandran, who's one of the, who's the PI or on one of those labs. He's a professor of microbiology and immunology over at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Yep. Um, what, who's up next, Rich? Uh, yeah, it could be. Got to unplug though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, Judy. Judy writes, hello, prof- uh, Professor Twimbers. First, let me say <laughs> thanks for all the work you do and the great discussions. I'm a high school science teacher, and you are my professional development, since for the most part, K-12 education is spending their money on kids, not teachers. Probably a good thing for the short run. Second, I want to say thanks for the heads up on Emperor of All Maladies. I'm almost finished with this book and want more. Vincent, please write one about polio in your spare time, but you're not allowed to stop the TWIVs. <laughs> Third, I have a question about TWIV-166 and the making of haploid cells. Someone, I don't remember who, mm. said you could make haploid cells by disrupting the spindle formation. Yeah, stupid me said that. I was wondering if this is true since DNA is replicated no, during S phase it's of interf- interphase. It seems you'd end up with single chromosomes, yes, but they'd have multiple strands right. of DNA right. and therefore multiple copies of genes. Yep. I tried to look this up and found that there are polyteen chromosomes in Drosophila salivary glands with uh, 1,024 copies of DNA. Am okay. I misunderstanding a life cycle of cells, or do different cells replicate differently? Sorry to ask such a basic biology question, but I don't want to be giving my students inaccurate information. Thanks again for all you do, Judy. I'm the one responsible for the listening. Uh, in, in fact, I was thinking about that. One of the ways that uh, people that. Uh, that plant biologists. Uh, deliberately make plants multiploid is to treat them with colchicine, right? Uh, which messes up uh, the spindle. Or they just cut them. They, by pruning, you can actually get them to go that way too. Um, and so, yeah, you're more likely in those situations to get multiploid cells rather than haploid cells. So I had a long discussion with Steve Goff about this because I wanted to get straightened out because I realized that I had made a... a, a a uh, conceptual error in my speculation. And the initiation of DNA synthesis as the initial part of chromosome replication is not understood in terms of what the initial signal is. You know, a resting cell that's got just a nucleus with not its segregated chromosomes already, and then all of a sudden it decides to divide. What is that signal? (coughs) What is that signal that actually makes it uh, start? And then once it starts... Then you've got, it looks like you're looking at the assembly of a car all at once. Every part is being put on. It looks, it's chaotic if you think about what's going on. So trying to envision how you could separate from the S phase, which is the synthesis of DNA phase, and not stitch it back together to make a diploid chromosome is uh, very difficult to imagine. What step in that process would you interrupt in order to get it to stay as a single half a chromosome. And uh, so Steve and I, you know, I listen more than I talked, of course, uh, which is very atypical for me, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and I, I still didn't have a clear idea of, of why, how you make a haploid cell line. And he says it's all by luck. Well, yeah, in this case, actually, uh, God did it. Okay? <laughs> right. Uh, if you're a creationist, a, there's no a, problem uh, with it. It's this. a cell line. Uh, it's a, it was a cancer cell yeah. Uh, yeah. that was pulled out of somebody and just happened to be Except for one chromosome, haploid, and they sheer, all, sheer blind skill, and they yeah. all don't stay that way. They, they are mixed cultures of some cells are haploid and some yeah. cells are diploid. So you have a, a propensity of haploids. All right, we um, last time we also talked about the English sweating sickness. Ah, yes. Yeah. And I had emailed Michelle, who writes a blog called Contagions, and. Um, 
It was interesting. She said, oh, no, I don't specialize in the 16th century. <laughs> <laughs> so so interesting. And she passed it on to several colleagues who, who sent us sent me emails. So let me read these. One is from Lori. Part of my graduate work addresses the sweating sickness, less what it actually might have been, but rather whether people thought it was contagious or not. Compar- Part of my graduate work felt like the sweating sickness. <laughs> <laughs> we should point out that was done in my lab, right? right. <laughs> but comparing medical writings with chronicles, letters, and other such materials. That said, there has been there have been several articles written about the potential identity of the disease, most of which come to different conclusions. Until the latter part of the 20th century, medical historians largely believed that the sweating sickness was a form of typhus, a virulent relapsing, or military fever, or influenza. Since the 1900s, historians have examined contemporary accounts of the disease's symptoms in minute detail, analyzing those symptoms in correlation with virulence, spatial and temporal distribution patterns, potential transmission models, concurrent environmental conditions, and the clinical features of modern diseases. They have variously speculated that the disease was a viral hemorrhagic fever, an arbovirus, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, an enterovirus, inhalational anthrax, or dengue fever. <laughs> oh, my oh, God. That's quite a list, yeah. <laughs> so she sends a list of some of the better articles written about the disease. There are quite a few, so we'll include those. Uh, in the show notes. And also, I received an email from John who writes, I must confess, first of all, that I am very critical about retrospective diagnosis as a properly historical exercise, as well as a rather skeptical, as rather skeptical about the alleged results provided by new methods for molecular biology and genetics to identify past diseases. Some years ago, I used the case of the mysterious English sweating sickness to raise a historiographical question, namely, to what extent the exercise of retrospective diagnosis uh, of the disease may depend upon the variable, fashionable medical concerns of each time about this group of diseases. And he sends a biographical reference for this work. I think that's probably spot on. Yeah. Right. That a lot of these his- historical yeah, yeah, yeah. analyses of very poorly documented um, outbreaks sh- tell us more about who we are now than sure. about the outbreaks. That's right. It's it's sort of a Rorschach test. Yeah, I think right. unless you get the organism some way, right? Yeah, if you if you go back and you and you isolate a particular pathogen and it's in the abs- and you've rigorously demonstrated that it's in the absence of other pathogens and you find yeah. it from multiple samples, then yeah. yeah. But that's that's extremely that's rare. rare. But hieroglyphs and uh, uh, drawings in medical texts like the Tibetan uh, uh, tabloids that uh, have been passed down for generations shows the outbreaks of smallpox and things of this sort. And I had the pleasure of uh, actually touring the Anthropological Museum in Mexico City, and there are some wonderful pre-Columbian statues, uh, one of which depicts Chagas disease, which has this big uh, swollen eye. It's called a Chagoma, mm-hmm. and uh, you can tell right away. And you can also see that they were trephinating at the same time because they had little holes in their head. And there it was sitting right in front of you as sort of a, an icon to say, and watch out for this one because it'll... It'll make your eye look like this. So. Yeah, I think we I think we commented on the last episode that yeah. if it's if it's a case if it's a disease that produces really distinctive pathology, right? Like smallpox or polio or or a lot of the parasitic diseases, you say, ah, well, that's this. Um, sure. and that's a different story. Or cholera. That, or cholera, right? You everybody suddenly got diarrhea. That's right. Um, it's it's pretty diagnostic, and there's not really a lot of debate. But I think cases like this, where you've got sure. essentially flu-like symptoms, yeah, but having um, it go away so fast, I would doubt that it's a vector-borne disease in that sense. You unless know, it, something changed with the vector. Yeah. Well. Anyways, so, uh, John sends us links to two of his articles, and they're both yep. downloadable. So. You can check that out. So thanks to John. John is in Barcelona. And Lori, whose letter we read previously, is at the University of Ottawa. Nice. And I think we should save the next one for next time. Because yeah, because that'll take some discussion. Take some that'll discussion. take a while. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And so let us do some picks of the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Professor De Pommier. Yes, Professor Reconiello. You did have a pick earlier today, didn't you? Yeah, I did. And you asked me to make a list of uh, potential movies that uh, had as its uh, main theme outbreaks of disease. That was your homework? That was my homework. So I was doing my homework while you guys were 
jabbing away and then informing the public as to what was going on in that other movie. So The Life and Times of Louis Pasteur starring Paul Muni was one of them. It's probably not the exact title of the movie, but I remember seeing it. And there's a lot of disease depiction in the movie. I presume some of it's accurate. Uh, and mostly about the rabies and the, um, uh, the diseases that uh, affected sheep and his vaccine development for that disease. And then there's The Black Robe. Black Robe is a fabulous movie. It's about the introduction of smallpox into the uh, Huron Indian tribes through the French missionaries. Hmm. And uh, virtually there are no Huron, Huron Indians left because they were all killed off by the blankets that the uh, missionaries brought over with them. And there was a similar wonderful depiction of smallpox in the, uh, the, the documentary uh, historical depiction of John Adams' life on uh, home box office television, I guess it was, or PBS te television. His family uh, actually caught smallpox. His children got it, and uh, they, Who they showed it. Did you say it. John Adams? John Adams, yeah. He, they actually variolated them. Really? Yeah. Yes. Interesting. So that was another um, depiction of disease that was quite accurate, actually, and, then, and they showed what was happening in the new colonies as a result. Then Vanessa Red... I'm, I don't know if Vanessa Redgrave played in this movie or not, but it depicted plague graphically. It was an incredibly graphic movie and frightening, as a matter of fact. It was really stark in its presentation and, and quite... Uh, uh, it was almost an X-rated... Uh, uh, a disease movie in that sense. And then, of course, everybody mentioned Outbreak, but everybody forgot to talk about Andromeda Strain. So the Andromeda Strain okay. would be this uh, introduced uh, microbe from outer space that replicates like crazy under the microscope and then kills everybody. Um, <laughs> and then finally, there are some parasites worth talking about. One of them is in Deliverance. Uh, John Voight, of course, is the... Uh, and. Um, What's his face? The football player from Florida. Come on, you remember his name? <laughs> Who became an actor afterwards? Um, names are really escaping me right now. But the banjo player in that movie, that really skinny-looking older man that looked uh, like he had caught some disease. Actually, that is the way a hookworm victim would look. So they they made a very accurate portrayal of that one. And then there are some absolutely bogus depictions of stuff that no one ever heard of before like the wrath of khan with this earworm <laughs> that gets inside the brain and alters your behavior and uh finally my pick of the week <laughs> and everybody's anxiously waiting to hear i might have actually picked this in an earlier episode but i tend to forget things like this it's called guinea pig doctors and it's a book written by some um, news reporters from the baltimore sun and they produced a book of documented uh, physician-induced iatrogenic, uh, auto-iatrogenic diseases of people trying to prove a point that they were right. I know this vaccine works. I'm going to give myself the disease, and I've already vaccinated myself, and I'm sure I'll survive, and of course they died. Um, and there are lots of these uh, examples throughout medical history, and so guinea pig doctors actually documents that. Yeah, My grandfather did that. Really? He was working on larva migrans, creeping eruption. Oh, you're kidding. And he was convinced that it was caused by, he was eventually convinced that it was caused by a cat tapeworm. Uh, he'd already figured out some effective treatments for it, so um, he needed a handy case to study, so he inoculated his left arm. Wow. Ah! And sure enough, he developed the series of painful lesions up his left arm. And uh, Yeah. But it was, a cat tape, it was a cat hookworm. Cat hookworm, yes. Yep. But he didn't get a Nobel Prize, did he? No, no, that uh, wasn't really Nobel Prize work. It was because it was a non-lethal disease and it was restricted to... <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a pain in the uh, whatever. Of, it's, yes. a, it's an awful disfiguring thing, though, when it happens in, in bad areas. You, and, yes, when it's not treated. It's in true. fact, Dixon, you have not picked it before. I just checked, so Excellent. Thank so you guinea pig much. doctors is my pick. Thank you. You're welcome. Alan. Oh, my pick of the week um, is a trove of newly discovered microscope slides, which doesn't sound all that interesting. Um, but in this case, it was somebody um, at the British Geological Survey was poking around in a closet somewhere and opened up a, an unlabeled drawer and saw all these old slides of, um, hmm. of fossils that had been neatly sectioned and polished. And this is a, this is a way to look at um, fossilized plants under the microscope. You can take sections and polish them. And he could tell they were very old, and he started reading the labels on them and saw that these were prepared by um, Joseph Hooker, who was a botanist to the 
to the British Geological Survey uh, around the time Charles Darwin was sending his samples there. And in fact, some of these were um, were samples from the Voyage of the Beagle, the Darwin Amazing. sent back. Cool. They've been really sitting cool. in a drawer for 170 years or so. Uh, apparently, Hooker was not very good about keeping his lab notes in order, and he never entered these particular samples in the, in the appropriate index, so nobody knew they were there. And now that they've been discovered, they've gone ahead and put a good portion of the collection online so you can browse through and look at these. Uh, I think they're really beautiful, some of them. Yeah, they're cool polished stone that's got these fossils of, of various plants in them. So Cool. They're kind of Excellent. small, though. I can't see them very well. Oh, if you click on one, you can eventually follow the links, and you can get to a um, oh, bigger pop -up. version. There you yeah. go. Okay, on a different page. Nice writing, too. Yeah. The tissues destroyed by crystallization. Neat. That is great. Uh, Rich, what do you have for us? I got some humor. <laughs> um, we always have humor here. On so Twitter. this was uh, this was pointed out to me by my uh, son-in-law, and it's a little YouTube click uh, uh, clip. Actually, who was it? Did you find the other one, Alan? I did. Yeah, there's a there, slightly higher quality upload of it. There, uh, it's by a, a stand-up comedian named uh, uh, Louis C.K. And um, one of their titled by the uploaders, I guess. One of them's called Learn to Appreciate Technology. The other one call, is called Everything's Amazing and Nobody's Happy. It's the same clip, and it's uh, it, this is something that strikes me all the time, is that we're surrounded by this amazing technology, <laughs> and everybody takes it for granted. Takes it for granted to the point where they complain about it yes. when, when it's not working perfectly, and if they'd step back for a minute and uh, just, just think about it for a minute, they'd realize how amazing it was. The line, I love it, in it is he talks about flying in airplanes and he says you're sitting in a chair in the sky right <laughs> and you're belly aching about whether or not your chair goes back far enough right? hmm. so it's good nice yeah yeah louis ck seems to be very popular these days he's pretty funny I keep hearing about him all over uh my pick is to apple software packages that were just announced today, which I checked out briefly, and although I haven't used them extensively, they look awesome for anyone who would like to write a book or give a course. The first one is um, called iBooks Author. So Apple does have a bookstore online. It's not as extensive as uh, Amazon's, but it does exist, and now they have released a free app which lets you put together a book quite easily and upload it to the store for sale. It's called iBooks Author. It is just just beautiful in typical uh, Apple style. It's very simple. You can combine text and images and movies if you'd like and make really, really compelling textbooks or any kind of book that you want. So Dixon and I are going to make his parasitology book ah, use yeah. this. Yeah, Does it I let you upload a PDF version of a book uh, oh, and just make it into a book? <clears throat> No, you just it's uploaded in a EPUB format onto the i iBook store. Okay. Uh but it's much easier than mm -hmm. doing a Kindle format because we've been struggling with that. We have. It's really a pain in the well, neck. Well, we have a two column book we wanted to make it into a one column book and that was the problem. The only problem of course with the Kindle bookstore is that um most of them are black and white unless you have a fire, of course. But right. uh, And right. the iBook store, now, this makes it very easy to do color books, so it's pretty cool. So that's one. And the other one is a new app, which um, – <clears throat> wrong link. Sorry, gentlemen. Uh, iBooks, no. It's called the iTunes University app, the iTunes U app. So many of you know that – you can, uh, if you're a teacher at a university, you can upload your course materials onto iTunes University. I do that. All my lectures are on iTunes University. And this is now an app for iPad or iPhone that lets you view this content. And it also allows educators to upload other materials in addition to, to their lectures. So it's a free app. It's like an interface to iTunes University. So I'm definitely going to use this to manage my online mm -hmm. courses. And for people who want to view it, I think it's great as well. So these are two cool new ways to teach uh, the world, again, provided by Apple. Technology, again, the world is changing really fast. So it is. 
They actually announced these today at the Guggenheim Museum here in New York City. They had an event. We also have a listener pick of the week from Judy, who is um, the author of the email we read previously. A reading suggestion from Project Gutenberg, a short children's book, Makers of Many Things, by Eva March Tapan, who lived from 1954 to 1930. Which is a neat trick. Wait a minute. (laughs) You see, time doesn't always go in one direction. But she wrote forward. (laughs) No, she had a backward. Someone wrote her backward. (laughs) She wrote a book that explains how things are made, the little friction match, India rubber, kid gloves, how rags and trees become paper, how books are made, from goose quill to fountain pens and lead pencils, the dishes on our tables, how the wheels of a watch go around the making of shoes in the cotton mill, silkworms, and their work. A fascinating old-style kid's book. Mm. She gives a link to that. Of course, Gutenberg, it's free, right? Yep. Very cool. So it's 1854, Uh 1930, Mm. according to Wikipedia. Roger that. Very good. Wikipedia's back up. Excellent. And that'll do do it. it. That's it for... Our episode on Contagion. Hope you enjoyed that. And it'll probably be a while before another science-based movie comes out. (laughs) And they certainly aren't going to ask us to consult. Nope. No, no. Nope, nope. Not after this show. (laughs) I have to go watch uh, Andromeda Strain. I read the book years ago. I don't know if I ever watched the movie. I think I watched the movie a long time ago. You're going to have trouble with that because it's really an old movie. So uh, technologically as a movie, it's hard to watch. It's It's, it's very, very Star Trek-ish in the special effects. (laughs) You bet. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. You can find Twiv on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace at microworld.org and also at twiv.tv. We also have an app for your iPhone or Android device. You can get that over at microworld.org. If you like Twiv and you have just newly subscribed on iTunes, do leave a short review or commentary. It helps us to stay visible over there on the podcast directory. Send us your questions and comments to Twiv. At twiv.tv. Dixon de Pommier. Yes, Vincenzo. Thank you for joining us, Dixon. Oh, my pleasure as usual. Do you have a middle initial? Yes, it's D. D cubed. <laughs> D cubed, that's right. I think that's what we should call you from now on. Oh. D cubed. Oh, I thought I had escaped that one. <laughs> no, we should call him 3D. 3D, oh, 3D is fine. Oh, 3D that's a good fine. idea. 3D is fine. Where can people find you, Dixon? Well, several places. It's medicalecology.org or trichinella.org, trichinellapage.org, or the uh, verticalfarm.com. At Vertical Farm, you blog regularly, don't you? I do. I just uh, wrote another one, in fact. Is it any good? I hope so. <laughs> Okay. I, I'm not the Check judge of all this. It's just that's graffiti right. with punctuation. It's yeah. graffiti with punctuation. <laughs> that's right. That's that's a great episode title. Yeah. Yes. Except we can't use it for this one because it doesn't make any sense. No. Alan Dove, where can people find you? Uh, well, standing at my desk a lot of the time, but it's much <laughs> easier to find me at alandove.com. Thanks for joining us, Alan. Always a pleasure. And Rich Condit, where can they find you, Rich? Uh, they can find me at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And they can look at my fancy model of uh, Vaccinia at vacciniamodel.com. Nice. But, you know, that's, you do that once and then you're done. Because <laughs> it never changes. It right? never changes. It doesn't it's mutate? Like, it's not like Come a on, it mutates. <laughs> it mutates. Rotate it around. The virus mutated. <laughs> that's right. Thank you, Rich, for joining us. Sure. Great to be here. Always have a good time. And I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at my blog, which is, what is it called again? Uh, what, what without punctuation? Uh, graffiti. graffiti. Graffiti with punctuation. Graffiti That's with punctuation. Is. Virology dot WS. That was, by the way, Lawrence Fishburn who said that, right? Or was it the uh, other guy? I don't, yes, that's right. It was Fishburn who hey, was uh, criticizing Jude Law. Correct. Graffiti with punctuation. <laughs> and unfortunately, the domain graffiti with punctuation dot com has a domain squatter on it right oh, now. Oh, brother. Wow. That was quick. I guess it was from the movie, right? I assume so. Unless it's an old saying. Yes, you can find me at virology.ws. Did I say that already? You did. Yeah. But it's I don't think you got all the way through that. There was a bunch of other garbage. I get distracted. Right. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.
You know, it's too bad it didn't emanate from a chicken, and then the lead could have been Gwyneth Poultry. <laughs> oh. <laughs>